There's so much wonderful music this morning. I'm sorry that I'm just going to talk now. <laughs> <clears throat> so from our, our second scripture passage this morning, we hear about this ointment of nard. And nard comes from a plant that is uh, scientifically called Nardostachys jetamansi, but that's very complicated to say each time. So instead, people tend to call it spike nard. And it is named that sort of as a reference to what it looks like as a plant. It, it's tall and spindly, has like three foot stalks, and at the top of it, it grows this ball of flowers, of individual flowers. And the pistils, which are the, the center part of a flower bloom, when they bloom, they stick out in every direction. So it kind of looks like a Dr. Seussian kind of a flower, but it looks like this pink ball with these spikes coming off of it. So pe folks call it spike nard or simply nard when it is turned into the perfume like in our passage. It's native to the Eastern Himalayan mountains, so think Nepal and Bhutan, and it grows in a region between 10,000 and 17,000 feet up. And for millennia upon millennia, spike nard has been used all over the world uh, for the oil that it produces. See, in its rhizomes, that is the, like, the, the stem structures under the soil that grow, that grow horizontally, when you crush those up, you get the sap. And then if you distill that down many, many times, you get this really thick, super intensely scented oil that has been used throughout Asia and Europe since the time of Abraham for religious ritual, for body anointment, as incense, as medicine, and in perfume. And it still is to this day. One of the issues, though, is that um, rhizomic plants, that is plants that have rhizomes, they reproduce through those rhizomes. They spread this way and then grow sister and daughter plants up, and that's how they spread and, and proliferate. However, when you dig the plant up and you take out those rhizomes and you crush them, you kill the plant and make it unable to reproduce. This is one of the factors that is contributed to spike nard being labeled as critically endangered in the wild. However, while it is uh, rare to find in the mountains of the Himalayas today, it was similarly a rare find in the time of Jesus. And we can sense that in the shock on the, uh, on the disciples' faces and in their words, considering that this perfume, this ointment of nard that this woman had, had traveled 16,000 feet down the Himalayas to be turned into perfume, and then traveled across land, India, Asia, Mesopotamia, and all the way to Jerusalem in the first century. It's a very long road indeed. But also in the time of Jesus, there were established routes of trade from east to west for the very purpose of selling perfumes and oils and incenses. Just as there was a silk road, there was an incense road as well. And to ensure that their wares made it to western markets intact and not spilled out along that long road, eastern perfumers would seal their bottles closed, often by means that could not be undone or opened again, meaning that people would have to do like the woman in our scripture does this morning, break the container open and use all of its contents at once, like a piggy bank, you can only do it once. The description of the woman breaking open this alabaster jar, I'm imagining her in the house with Jesus, she, she brings it whether it was a family heirloom or just something truly, just a, an absolute treasure that she had, holding it for a moment and then ultimately deciding to break it open of, and then breaking it open and, well, here we go, I'm doing this now. It reminded me, it reminds me in a way of a time in my childhood when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old when I broke a vase that was kept in our dining room closet growing up. It looked like a shrunken down champagne flute and it had flowers and vines etched into the glass. It was very pretty. And I was holding it, trying to force a towel down into the bottom of it. I was not trying to clean it. I was just being a fool. <laughs> and so I was 
taking this towel and trying to force it down to the bottom of the vase, and it just broke. It just shattered in my hand. And I didn't know what the vase was exactly. I didn't know if there was a story behind it, but I did know that it was pretty and kept on the top shelf, and pretty things kept on the top shelf tend to be special for one reason or another, and its special status was definitely confirmed in the look on my mother's face and the tears in her eyes when she saw what had happened. Yet, even before she came into the room and saw me holding just the stem and the glass all on the floor, this is the alabaster jar moment here, there was this terrible sense that came over me, just me and the broken glass. A blank yet filling sense of dread a buzzing in my skull, a weight in my chest. It was something like grief and despair and fear. And I didn't, just was seized. I didn't know what to do in that moment. Not because of the punishment that was to follow or the regret of a very, very poor decision, but simply put, it was just the stark truth of the moment that this act could not be undone a terrible, cold sense of finality, that it was here. And what's next? Now, perhaps to not exactly such a melancholic or dramatic sense, but life has these moments in them. They're full of these moments, moments that sweep us along where we feet, where we feel our feet lift up suddenly from the ground as a current seizes us and takes us along this cause and effect. One domino falls, then the next, and the next, and then suddenly we are stepping foot into a future that we did not plan, we did not expect, we did not choose, and we probably would not choose. It doesn't have to be a shattered vase or a broken alabaster jar or a crushed plant sort of moment, though. It could be many things. It could be the moment of becoming a parent. It could be choosing one university or one company over another. It could be deciding to retire, to move, to marry, to divorce. It sometimes could be even more terrible than a shattered vase, a choice that we ourselves don't even make ourselves. It could be the phone call at 2 a.m., the test results, the invitation, the one more drink that someone else has. Each of these is a breaking open, one in which all that we have and all that we are and all that we've learned and all that we hope suddenly is placed into the hands of a future yet unfolding, and we are at an arm's length. We cannot control it. It is taking us along. At times, perhaps with joy, perhaps with relief or maybe shock, and definitely at times with fear and grief and worry, the thick intense stuff of living. But regardless of how the breaking open strikes us, it indeed cannot be undone, and it will come to define much, if not all, of what comes next. And this is just with us, you and me, us who can only occasionally distinguish through the fog blurry guesses at what the future holds. For Jesus, though, as he passes through the gates of Jerusalem and sets into motion a machine that will, in the end, break him, he knows it. He knows. He sees through time to the end of it. He has told others of it. He knows where the current that is welling around his ankles as he walks through the streets will end up, where it will toss him out. Shattering a vase, breaking a jar, crushing a plant— riding a cult, entering a city. The moment breaks open before him, people around him shouting and crying and waving their branches, and he sees all the way down the road, down the week, through time to the hilltop, and three crosses standing there. How it must have been for him. To feel the breaking open with every step, to know where it is leading, and how he does his living still. 
his choice to continue living. Today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The choice to continue on shows us, points to us how to, how to handle our own broken, open selves. In the week that is to come, he shows us that there is indeed a place and a purpose for our anger, our driving out, our whipping, our table-flipping anger. There is a place and a purpose still for our continued growth in teaching and in learning. There is place and purpose still for our joy in the breaking of bread with family and friends to gather in the name of celebration and honor, place and purpose for our grace and our love in feeding others, especially those who would not feed us in return, place and purpose for our tenderness in the washing of feet, for our despair in praying in the garden, and place and purpose for our ultimate faith that while we might be caught in a current, carried along our feet, not touching the ground, that indeed, through time, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing under heaven shall be well. That while we might find ourselves broken open, we are not yet broken ourselves. That we still have it, to gather up what is at our feet, hold it as high up as we can, and say, I can turn this into deep, deep living. Amen.